maybe with that, um, Andrew, uh, would you be interested in in uh, giving uh, giving some additional context here? Sure, sure. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, the the proposal that I worked on um, and uh, rose out of some conversations that Andrew Woods and I had at the Fedora Samvera camp that we held in Oxford at the beginning of September. And uh, it sort of came out of a need for us at Oxford to, um, to have a bit more transparency in how digital repository systems um, store their objects and how they organize their objects as uh, bits on a file system, let's say. Um, and uh, so we have some fairly specific requirements or, um, for the type of institutional repository we would like to build and we would like to see. Um, and I've tried to put those into the, um, into the uh, Oxford Common File System Layout document that was linked in the, uh, the, the Google Doc. Um, so I was just going to run through those and explain them a bit more. Um, just a note on the name, um, Oxford isn't specific to the University of Oxford. It's along the same lines as Dublin Core or Portland Common Data Model. It's um, sort of the city where the idea came from. It's a working title. So don't think it's specific to the University of Oxford. It's kind of, if the, if the university was called something other than the town name, it would be a different name, but there you go. Um, so, um, we are looking to build a, um, a new institutional repository and a new storage system for institutional repositories, um, backing primarily for, for myself, backing our digital Bodleian service, but also potentially other um, bits of our institutional repository e-theses and that sort of thing. Um, and what we're looking at specifically, one of the main um, requirements for that is, uh, for us, is rebuildability. So the ability for um, a system to understand what's on a disk. Um, if the system uh, in some way um, gets a corrupted database or uh, does, stops working, if the software stops working, we want to be able to build a new instance of software pointed at to rebuild it. Uh, that's kind of one of the, the principal requirements. Um, the, around that is also the idea of building microservices against a file system. So rather than a single monolithic um, application that manages fixity checking and validation and other things, we want to be able to write a small number of, of uh, dedicated services that kind of treat the file system as an API. Um, so be able to understand the structure of objects on that file system um, and know how to, to understand, say, a versioning structure or the, the transformations that an object has been through in order to, um, to better audit or understand how to pull content out of that that object. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, also the ability to understand how to version uh, objects. So if you have a file that where you might change it from the PDF version that you've accepted into say a PDF A version, or if you have a book where page three, the image for page three has to be reshot but you have people referencing the old image, you'll want to be able to know how, how to pull out older versions of that digital object um, and how to manage that data within a file system. So um, we'll want to be able to, to uh, address that as well. Um, and um, just basically making it easier for backup and for other you know, Unix commands or whatever commands that you want to run against it, um, that you don't have to have software mediating access to, um, to your digital object repositories so that you can use 
fairly standard tools to manage the files that sit on disk and understand and know what you're looking at when you see a bunch of binary blobs sitting there. Um, so for us, I think that was the main driving uh, force behind it. Um, really, it came out of um, trying to figure out how we can work with, um, with institutional repository systems and how what we can contribute to the community in order to, um, to uh, look at what other people are doing to try to figure out um, ways we can cooperate. So uh, that's a basic overview of where we were or where we came from. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from everybody else about um, what you do and if uh, there's any interest in collaborating and if our experiences are shared and our requirements are shared across other institutions. So thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, and, and maybe just to add on to that last point, I, I, I don't think that this initiative is intended to be a sort of one solution to rule them all, but but rather just trying to uh, figure out what the landscape looks like, what folks are currently doing, uh, you know, the, the various um, initiatives um, and, and art that exists, and ideally uh, get some common understanding across uh, what I would consider us as the community around uh, you know, what what is the problem and what are some successful solutions and 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 maybe uh, promoting that and, and making it a little bit more visible and um, specifying or documenting that um, more clearly if if it's not already done. Uh, I, I think there's maybe an ideal scenario where uh, a lot of what you're describing, Andrew. Um, there, there are initiatives that kind of do most, if not all of that, and, and just uh, getting, uh, getting uh, that uh, clarified um, and uh, identifying it. So uh, maybe with that, um, there, so uh, maybe we, we can go ahead and, and just uh, introduce um, folks who have volunteered to speak to uh, relevant initiatives and while folks are talking yeah I, I encourage um, as I said before um, uh, maybe uh, trying to tease out requirements that you might be hearing or or uh, problems that are being solved by uh, these various initiatives and, and making sure we document them because um, ideally out of this call it's um, there there will be uh, tidbits that are being collected along the way um, so with that, um, Tim, uh, are you uh, in a position to speak for a few minutes um, about what might be happening at uh, UCSD? Yeah, I'm here. I hope you can hear me okay. I did not want to be on my commute coming in, but that's, that's the reality. So uh, if it gets too bad, just let me know. And I can, uh, well, hopefully you're not driving. Well, I am driving, but I have a safe, luckily Zoom has a safe mode, so I don't have to the phone's on the ground, I'm on Bluetooth, so it's fine. Be safe, uh, all right. Yeah, it's all safe. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the overview and the, the uh, opportunity to kind of talk. I know we have a few other folks, uh, hopefully on the call from UCSD as well, so they can maybe jump in uh, if they have more to add. But uh, we are kind of right in the mix of where, where you all are, it sounds like. Um, we have, I, I kind of, I put some on the, on the related reading, I put um, an article that explains Chronopolis, uh, which hopefully most of you folks know about um, for digital, uh, for preservation. And that's a system that we um, operate in, uh, with partners in Texas Digital Libraries, as UMIAX and NCAR. Um, and it, we, it, it's POSIX based and RSync, and there's all kinds of details on the uh, website that you can read more about. I also put up a document where we spent some time uh, one of our, our programmers spent some time trying to get Moab versioning with uh, with Chronopolis, and um, that has a lot more technical details in there about the API calls and, and trying to do um, versioning with preservation. And um, we didn't end up pursuing that. Uh, we we kind of wrote it out, did a version one spec, but it would take a lot of rewriting of our existing Chronopolis um, 
system to, to go down that path. Uh, and it, it, the level of effort on that was, um, it just, it, it wasn't the right time. Uh, and maybe, maybe something can come out of this that would really help us with versioning and the, the file system. We really like the idea. Um, but right now we're very much uh, POSIX based. We, we don't have a ton of things in object. We're always exploring that. Um, and it's interesting that I don't, I don't know. I would be interested to hear from other folks if, if their solutions are um, object or file based, just to kind of hear a little bit more about that. Um, we don't have tape anymore in our infrastructure, so it is it is just a lot of different hard drives and different file systems moving around. Um, our primary uh, file system is is OneFS from Isilon. That's where our primary storage is. We also have um, a Cumulo, which has QSFS, uh, which has a little bit more detail in the file system, a little more hopeful that we could do some more things with that since it has an API. Um, and that's kind of where we're at, Andrew. I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to take too much time. I know there's a ton more people on the agenda. So uh, if there's any questions, I'm obviously happy to answer them, but I'll put more reading if, uh, uh, on the agenda if I can. Yeah, well, well uh, thanks, Tim. And, and quite honestly, given the, yeah, the density of um, the agenda, I would suggest that questions, at least at this point, either will probably most effectively go into the, the Google Doc. But as I mentioned, maybe not everyone was on, on agenda item number four. Uh, there is a link to a Slack channel. Uh, you can go ahead and self-register there, not while you're driving, um, to um, also uh, post and answer and discuss. Uh, questions. Um, so, and, and, and I think this applies to uh, all of the speakers here uh, and, and the listeners. Um, if, if we could be thinking about, so for each of these, you know, what, what specifically is the problem that was uh, uh, trying to be solved? Um, and then what are the salient aspects of such a solution? Um, and then to the degree that uh, it makes sense, what are maybe some pros and cons? Of, um, of that solution. So um, uh, you, maybe for, for, for the sake of, of, of time here, maybe people can just be uh, keeping those points in mind, um, but I think we'll, we'll save further questions to the end. So uh, thank you, Tim and uh, uh, Julian, are, are you in a position? Yes, yes I am. Great, awesome. So hello everyone, I'm Julian Molly. I'm from Stanford Libraries, um, and we use uh, Moab in the Stanford Digital Repository. And right now we are actually engaged in a development effort to uh, create um, a new preservation catalog for our repository. And um, Andrew, you may be pleased to know that one of our core requirements, actually my core requirement is I should be able to completely delete that catalog and have it reconstitute itself based on the contents of our uh, disk. Um, and I've been very, very clear about that. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get it. Um, our code is uh, open source, available on the internet. Um, it's on our GitHub, which I can put into the channel when I find it. Um, but bear in mind, this is an active development. So we're just at the stage now where we can um, catalog um, everything that's on disk, get it into the data store and start to do some, some basic manipulations. Next up is fixity checking and verification. Um, let's see what else can I say. So um, our current object store um, is on disk, and we write it to tape with a third-party backup solution, IBM Spectrum Protect, otherwise known as TSM. We are trying to move away from that because we, don't, we want to bring the backup system into the preservation system. And we feel that having a third party vendor provide that to us, it's, it's kind of a black box. The, the repository doesn't know about the status of the backups. So we're changing that by using the preservation catalog as the, uh, the tracker of the backups. And we're going to start using um, uh, web services, AWS Glacier, Oracle Cloud Storage Archive, uh, maybe some other storage destinations as well as uh, backup targets, well, archive targets for mob objects. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, as part of moving mob objects into the cloud, we're going to have another look at how um, mob objects can um, be stored there in an efficient way. Um, for an S3 based object store, um, we're targeting infrequent access object stores, and they have um, some cost 
some interesting cost models that are not quite as compatible with how Moab lays stuff down on disk, which is there's that 128K minimum billable unit, uh, which is not great when the majority of a Moab object store is 4K or less files, um, provenance XML docs. So we're going to look to see what we could do about that. Not immediately. That's probably a, a year or so off, but it's definitely in our minds. Um, other than that, uh, Moab, as you know, is an um, archive information packet. Um, we use Pear Tree, a Pear Tree-like system, to lay that down on disk. It works OK. Uh, we might want to tweak it a little bit going forwards. Um, especially once we start looking at, again, putting this into S3-based object stores. Uh, as you're probably aware, there is a path limitation or a like, key size, key name size limitation of like about 500 characters or so. And so if you go too far down the, the pear tree path there, you can run into problems, but you need to make sure, so you need to make sure that you have enough entropy in your, um, your naming conventions that it can be properly uh, clustered across the S3 object store. Um, I think that's about it for now. I'll post the information about the preservation catalog work into the Google Docs. And honestly, I'm very interested to hear what uh, everyone else in the community is, is up to and uh, what they're hoping to achieve. So thank you. Yeah, well, well thank you, Julian. And, and so an interesting, well, uh, several interesting points there, but one, uh, you, so Moab seems like it has been designed to work on the file system, um, but also you're talking about moving it into the cloud. And, and is that is the idea there that, that the cloud be native or sort of a, a backup of the file system? Maybe I missed that. Initially, it's backup because we have we know that there are going to be some issues. Well, not issues, there are cost issues. Obviously, Moab will work just fine in S3, so long as you're willing to pay for it. And with the amount of data that we're looking at, you know, petabytes worth of data, um, that can get expensive. And um, it, so we're looking at using infrequent access object store and cold object stores um, as for like copies two, three, and four, essentially. And copy one is going to be on-prem, on disk. And so the easiest, most expeditious way to do that right now is to just basically tar everything up and just write single files of a mob object or your segmented tar files of a mob object to an S3 object store. And then whether that's like cold or, or warm store and then migrate it to Glacier if you're using Glacier or keep it on cold and treat that as, you know, I say backup copies, we archive copies of the online content that's kept on site. But yes, in the end, in the future, we want to be cloud native. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, well thanks. And, and actually, there are a ton of questions, but uh, uh, let's sort of do the survey uh, first, and, and then uh, we can circle back uh, on this call and in the future for uh, more details. So, but uh, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, John, are you? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Um, this is John Tunzi from the California Digital Library, um, and I appreciate uh, Andrew Hankinson's um, introduction, which really spoke to uh, the CDL's vision of using the file system, uh, relying heavily on the file system for archival work. Not only do you have all these extent tools for manipulating file system objects, but also those objects should, you know, seriously outlast any systems we build. Uh, so the file system is the constant here. Um, I mean, of course they change as well, but but the idea that you know you could um, you know lose your database indexes and reconstruct everything by simply exploring the file system is a really good one. Um, so um, I'll also make the point about uh, CDL was very attached to this microservices concept as well, which makes it easier to swap out systems you know component by component rather than as big monoliths. So um, I think. Uh, uh, um, Stephen Abrams and Perry Willett are also on the call, and so um, I hadn't had a chance to speak with them before, but they certainly might want to ch chime in at any point. Um, I'll, I'll just do a quick run through of some of the things that, that uh, came out of CDL with this um, in mind. Bagot is one of the things which is slightly, slightly predated the sort of articulation of these microservice concepts. Um, and it has, um, it was really developed as a file transfer mechanism um, um, and during our web archiving project. 
And it, we were surprised that people were beginning to adopt it as a unit of storage um, and building archival systems based on it. Um, at first I was a little bit horrified at that and then sort of resigned and accepting. Um, there's probably something, some good there, but I would sort of like, kind of like to see, if Baggett were to become a, a building block, I think it could be enhanced a bit. Um, but um, there you have it. It's sort of an accident of history, maybe as a archival storage. Um, I'll mention some other things. Um, I think the red uh, example, uh, the reverse directory deltas, it's another basically file system based um, way of storing differences. Uh, if you were to open up there's a PDF linked to that link on the page. It kind of actually <clears throat> illustrates a number of, of the rest of the things on this list. Um, you know, showing a file system layout that uh, um, this sort of exercises some of these concepts. Uh, for example, uh, Namaste and uh, I think Paratree maybe mentioned, and D flat is in, in there as well. So, D, um, so you've got. Um, the reverse directory deltas, it's a bit clunky for expressing differences, but it's, it has the, you know, the virtue of being all there sitting in um, sort of uh, plain old ASCII, mostly um, right in the file system. Um, as the deltas on an object, it could sit inside a larger home, which is like the digital flat, D flat, um, which is just another way of expressing, you know, uh, hopefully generic way of doing things, but it's quite hard to get these generic things quite right. Um, and so there, you know, there should be some forgiveness there for, uh, for a lot of extendability. Um, if you happen to have that open, you'll see an example of this next topic, which is the namaste, which is a sort of a name as text um, tags. It's a way of essentially taking the, the Unix file concept of the, there's the file command, F-I-L-E, which basically pulls a magic number out of a file and does a little more analysis and tells you, this is a file of this type. Well, extend that concept to directories because we're dealing with object directories and we're gonna have object directories of different types. Like this is gonna be a D flat object and this will be a red, Differencing directory inside a uh, digital flat, or this will be a bagot bag, or this will be, um, you know, something else, or this will be the root of a pear tree. Um, so the idea was basically when you do, you get to your object, you go, "What the hell is this?" Let me type ls. You type ls, and right there in the file listing is this name as text tag. It's, you just read it out of the ls listing without opening a file, and um, because the construction of the name of a file in that listing reveals the type of directory you're in. So that was a, that was a concept which we were using. I don't know how broadly that's caught on. Um, so that's for identifying the kind of object that you're in. Um, and then pear tree was this idea that basically identifying or helping you locate objects within a file system starting at some known root. Um, so essentially every object we deal with has a, an identifier and um, if you take pairs of characters and you create a directory at each pair of characters that creates a file system path and you can put something at the end of that. Um, so I think Hati Trust is using that. I guess Moab is using some version of that. Um, uh, as we created that, we kind of realized that pairs of characters might be a little limiting. So we said, you know, any N characters. So we've got pair tree for three characters at a time, four characters at a time. And the tools have often reflected that ability, that flexibility. So it's basically a pile of microservices that rely heavily on the, the beautiful non-volatile virtues of the file system. Um, and, um, you know, it's things that the file system kind of went out of style for a while. Maybe it's a bit back a little bit. Um, I'm not sure, um, but there you have it. Yeah, well, well thanks, John. Um, and and maybe just uh, uh, there there is a section at the bottom here for 
questions, which might be an effective way of, of collecting up questions as people speak. Um, but it, it does seem that uh, CDL uh, clearly over time has established uh, some some very clear and uh, you know, specifications around uh, a lot of the pieces uh, very relevant, I think, to uh, this discussion here. And, and some of those uh, in part have been pulled into the MOAB design. Um, uh, and, and maybe as further discussion, it'd be interesting to sort of hear uh, from from uh, CDL or maybe John and, and others uh, representative of CDL where, uh, where some of these standards are being used in practice, not necessarily right now for the sake of time, but, um, and, and then on the other side, what, what systems are sort of using variants, um, like maybe what we see in MOAB variants of some of these specifications and, and what, what were the deciding factors that, that drove to the variants of, versus just using them as specified. But the, the, these are things that I think would be interesting to tease out um, um, as, as we continue the conversation. But uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, Don, are you, uh, there you are. Oh yeah, hello. I'm here. Hey, yeah, right. it may be, uh, sometimes your, your voice can be quiet, so really oh, belt it out. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, we on, in, were in our situation. We we basically like we no, no human actually really interacts with the preservation store, but we want it in something independent because we know like the, the data is. To, we want it, the data to last. It'll probably outlast the systems that are ex accessing it. So we want it things in an independent vendor neutral format. You know, a way that we could reproduce everything. You know, modulo the operational details from the stored data. So in and, and, and our case, uh, the weird thing is, well, the key thing is that most everything is on tape to begin with. So that did not like having a lot of small files and we kind of wanted to make sure that files were immutable once they were written. So we didn't want something, a format where you had to keep changing things like to update like the objects. So we came up with a format that's kind of inspired by Moab. So we have a bunch of digital items and each item, so it contains files. So in that sense, it's kind of like an object store. And then we, and we like Moab, we separate the file data from the actual listing in a sense. So that way we can refer to files without having to re rewrite them. So it makes it space, space efficient. And then we just store like the differential for each version in individual separate bag files. So everything's stored on as bags. And then inside there we have the, the file data. And we also have like the various metadata to reconstruct the object kind of like similar to how Moab works. And then we have a, then we have a, um, a service basically that and then assigns a basically URL to every everything. So because most of our, our other internal systems, the developers like using web APIs. So this way it makes it look like a web API, even though underneath we could walk the file system and, you, and work on things directly. And it also gives us some flexibility. So if we want to, like we, like we, like we can this way, this lets us cache files, like this, uh, the caching of the file is separate from the actual preservation store and this manage, manager thing ha handles that. So that's so one thing we're working on right now is we want to cache things in S3 instead. We could have asked the way that the bag files are generated. We could have just stored everything in S3 to begin with because because everything is immutable once we wrote, once we write it, and and we just use like a naming convention. Sorry about that. Everyone's going to lunch. Anyway, anyway and we just use a naming convention. We use naming convention to then figure out like how to resequence things. So, so that's that that's that's kind of what we have. So kind of what we have. So people. So it's, it's in in theory. You, I mean, you can walk through on, on in theory, but most people don't actually see it like that. So it handles the versioning nice. I. <laughs> I didn't use it nearly all my time, but I do want to say that I think this effort, I, I, someone brought up PCDM earlier. And I think one of the things that I noticed with PCDM is, is even if it didn't in, in, end up with any kind of, like it didn't it help, help set a, give a frame for conversations for discuss what people were doing without having to, um, so people could at least say like how, how close they were together. And I hope that this, Okay, this effort kind of comes up with a similar way to at least give terminology to things so we can at least discuss what we're doing in a, in a, and give a better framework to we can put everyone together. So, so thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, well, no, uh, 
thanks for uh, the vote of support there and, and your um, your input there, uh, Don. And it, it seemed like there are some interesting elements uh, that are in your system, but I, I haven't seen uh, if there's some documentation that's available or, or source code or anything like that that people can look right. at. Is Does such yeah. a thing exist? Oh yeah, there is source code and documentation on GitHub. I'll put that in the notes. Great, or yeah, or if it's, if it seems like it's related reading, uh, that that could be a good oh, section too. Sure, sure. But what, what, whatever makes sense. So, uh, but thank you very much, Don. Yep. All right, um, Rosalind. Um, so at Emory, we're um, we've embarked on a multi-year effort to gather requirements around the needs for a digital repository, and that includes the digital library layer where you're viewing things and depositing things, but also the preservation layer as well. Um, we currently don't have, and I mean, we have things, but we don't have anything that's doing digital preservation, I think, to the extent that some of the other people who have spoke has. Um, but I should say that I worked at Stanford with Julian, um, and um, I worked with Richard Anderson for the for two years before he retired, um, and we had many many conversations about Moab, um, and I am fully convinced of its brilliance. So you would have a hard time convincing me otherwise. Um, my job at Stanford was to really use the preservation layer, that, that underlying layer that was MOAB, um, it, to um, reconstruct issues that would happen when people were requesting objects from the repository. And I should say that it was, I never ran across a case where the data on disk was a problem or that if there was a problem, I could always easily trace it to some type of human error. Um, one of the things that I think is um, fairly brilliant about Moab is that Richard, who um, I did email to see if he wanted, would be able to come today. Um, he had other plans. Um, he has retired. Um, so I'm gonna pretend that he's sitting in a diner somewhere eating breakfast right now. Um, and Moab, by the way, is a place, not a um, not an acronym. <laughs> it is where Richard lives. Um, but uh, one of the things that I think is brilliant is that Richard took all the components from things like Pear Tree, Bagot, D Flat, and combined them together to create um, Moab. And one of the things um, I we talked about was that essentially. Um, MOAB and digital object storage in general is archival storage is a way of um, transporting content through time. And that was something that I said the other day to Andrew, um, is that, you know, I know John had mentioned that using Bagot as archival storage seems um, seems a little bit off of what the purpose of Bagot was, but really when we're taking our content and we're putting it in an object store, we are doing that for somebody from 100 years from now. So we are expecting that that object will move around over time. Um, and that's one of the things that I think Moab does allow you to do is abstract out um, layers like if you're just using a local file tree. Um, or file structure, you could conceivably put it into another one. Like Julian said, there are, of course, issues around cost, um, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. I also wholeheartedly agree that some people version for things that they probably shouldn't be versioning for. That is a conversation for another day. Um, so one of the things that I'm hoping that we can do at Emory, and some of that, what I'm saying is my own personal opinion, um, and while I recognize I have some weight at Emory um, and the decisions that will be made, um, one of the things that we are really looking for are the goals that Andrew um, espoused when he first kicked us off, was um, making it possible to rebuild the IRR from the IR from the persistence layer, um, making sure that the persistence layer is self-describing, so I shouldn't need any application to go in and look at those objects. Um, and um, really being able to do backup and recovery with the services that are available to me. Um, at Emory, one of the challenges I face is that our storage is really 
expensive. And I don't have the luxury of owning my own data center like um, many other institutions um, do. My previous one, not that Julian owns a data center, but he kind of sort of does. <laughs> um, but uh, I need to be able to utilize either um, archival uh, services, um, something like Deepin or Chronopolis, um, in conjunction with my regular storage on disk. And so how do I do that in order to get three copies of a thing? Um, so that's kind of where some of Emery's thoughts are and some of my own personal thoughts are. I should say from Richard's email to me, he said, um, I'm welcome to share his email address if anyone has questions about Moab um, and would like to ask him. He says if he had to do it again, he would have created a standardized single signature. Um, he and I had actually talked about that quite a bit. Um, he preferred SHA-256, um, although many people handed us over with SHA-1 or MD5. Um, and he would have explored using JSON, JSON instead of XML to store manifest data. So those were his comments. Um, and perhaps if we meet again, he would um, attend. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Rosalind. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, I appreciate bringing the, the insight from uh, from your experiences and, and what you're trying to achieve at Emory. And um, and it seems like there there is a lot of good work in Moab and, and the degree to which we can we can pull on that. Um, uh, I think we'll all appreciate. Uh, so uh, moving on here, uh, Mark. Sure. Um, so I've got a set of slides that I'm not going to show because they're actually not that helpful in the grand scheme of things. It just kind of helped me put some thoughts together. So we, um, so at UNT, we've been, um, when the California Digital Library started to push out the specifications for the um, various microservices that John talked about, we kind of bit really quick and bit really hard on those and said, this is how we're going to start working with um, our repository infrastructure. We um, really liked the idea of um, immutable objects. We would write content um, in a way that if we ever needed to go to writing content to tape in a, in a way that was um, you write it once and you never change it, um, it would work. And um, that, because of the way we were thinking about that, um, we uh, decided that as we needed to version content, it would just become new objects within our, our preservation repository. Um, we explicitly separated out kind of the, um, the descriptive metadata about objects from the actual bit streams that are kind of the preservation pieces that we're interested. And then those are just linked together with, through um, identifiers. Um, and by doing that, it allowed us to, uh, to really focus on kind of versioning the things that change daily um, and then don't mess with the things that almost never change. And so we've been running the, um, various versions of this in um, uh, production since 2009. Um, we have three different systems that we use kind of a combination of the tools that, or the, the, the specifications that John mentioned, we use Pear Tree for um, kind of uh, fanning out uh, our content across file systems. We use the CAN specification for kind of giving some structure to the Pear Tree and storage nodes. Um, we're actually storing all of our content as Bagot files. We use those for both transfer and then kind of long-term storage of content. And then we actually are a big fan of the, the Namaste um, files just to give kind of state to the objects, not only as they're at rest, but then um, kind of as they're moving through the process, um, those files are written kind of strategically at different points as kind of sanity checks for what's going on within the infrastructure. And it's a really lightweight way to do that. Um, we have a, um, a specification that I, I linked to in the, the resources for how we're packaging content. Um, and so this is actually the piece where we've not really spent a huge amount of time, um, like the, the, the D flat that John mentioned or the, um, the Moab 
um, for versioning since we are just, you know, if you have to change a page, you just rewrite the, the content. Um, so we've, we haven't dealt with, and you read the most recent version. Um, we, we haven't dealt with that internally, but uh, we do have a specification for how we're organizing, how we think about organizing content. Um, it does speak a little bit to how we um, are dealing with uh, content normalization. So if we get in um, content of version that we also want to create a normalized version for long-term access and preservation, we've got kind of a structure for that. Um, and I, I, I've linked to that document, but um, yeah, so I, I, I think the ability to, to build, to rebuild the systems is um, something that's great. We've had to do it a number of times um, for usually purposefully. So we want to actually set up a new, our, so our, in our systems we've built has actually changed much more than our file structure. So the, the same data we wrote 10 years ago is actually still the same on disk. We're just building new services on top of those. And as we build a new service, we just walk that file system and then rebuild our new, new indexes or new um, tools on top of that. And um, it's, it's worked out pretty well for us. So I, I think this is a really great direction to go. Um, kind of as a community. And I, I agree with um, Don and the idea that, you know, at least we can have kind of some common vocabulary for how we are doing and a very, very similar thing in kind of different ways that sometimes isn't interesting. Um, sometimes is really interesting on why we do it differently. But um, yeah, that's about all I've got. That, that, that's great, Mark. Um, and, and, and so you you did link well. You have the slides there, and, and you linked off to um, the package specification. It, it, it is there because it, it seems that, uh, uh, and and you didn't have time to go into it, of course. But uh, there, you've had a lot of great successes um, with with scale and um, and the other sort of preservation characteristics that we're trying to bring to the table here. Are, are, is there any other uh, design documentation that um, is available? Um, not that's clearly kind of, um, so, so there's a ton of documentation we did as part of a track audit, but it's really hard to just point to a specific thing that references just this specific kind of part of what we're doing. And so kind of the best one is that, that uh, packaging specification, which talks about kind of the same kinds of um, uh, data um, that's talked about in some of the Moab and the DFLAT. But I, if I can, if I, I'll go back and, and see what makes sense and see if there's any other um, resources I can link to up there. Okay, yeah, because I, I can guarantee that there is interest. Um, but uh, thanks, Mark. So uh, we we have, um, we have 10 minutes or so. I'd, I'd like to wrap up at, at the leave a few minutes to figure out um, some next steps, but maybe we have 10 minutes or so for uh, some general discussion or, or comments. Um, and, but maybe before diving right into that, I'd like to make sure, um, Andrew, uh, if, if you uh, have, have any uh, anything you'd like to inject, not, not to put you on the spot or anything, but you know. <laughs> That's okay, I can be put on the spot. Um, I, that was great, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, w these all sound like promising um, discussions to have, and I really appreciated Don's comment about we, we may not all arrive at the same point, but at least we'll have the same vocabulary to talk about things and and um, and uh, be able to, to sort of look, talk to each other, um, we'll come out of the closet, if as you will, for you know how we store our file systems. Um, so that's um, yeah. So that's all I wanted to say was you know this is um, is really helpful, and uh, I hope I look forward to hearing more and reading more. Um, to to uh, of all the additional reading that people have posted. Mark, um, Phillips, this is Rosie. Um, can I ask a question? It looks like underneath your data directory that you have some, you're storing metadata and provenance. Do you have um, specification, I'm looking, I also look through your the document you link to real quick and I don't see what you choose like how you choose to store that like how do you like, what kind of stuff do you put in logs what kind of stuff do you put in metadata what kind of stuff do you put in provenance 
um, because that's actually something that I'm thinking about right now is how we reconcile something like PCM, which we'll be using, right? And it says you need to keep um, uh, descriptive metadata about the object and technical metadata about the file. So I, I'm just curious how you break that up. So, so that example um, may be a little bit uh, confusing. That's actually um, the, all of that data is actually related to the conversion from a um, uncompressed um, video feed. Or so so we're, we're, we're digitizing a ton of video or, or film content like many other institutions are. And so we've actually chosen to use um, long-term storage with the FFV1 and MKV containers. And so that's actually just transformation data from the original to the, this is our normalized version. So that's actually very, very specific just to like that transformation process to, to be able to verify that it was bit perfect. Um, so in that case, like the, the really the, the only piece that um, kind of relates to all objects across is the fact that within the data data directory, we have kind of this sequence of folders that you can then put content in. And you and we've seen um, that's about as much as we've specified because at that point it's so different for um, probably 10 different content types. And um, so uh, some of most of our, our content actually ends up just being a single folder called 01 underscore TIFF because it's a sequence of TIFFs and that makes up the vast majority of our content. Um, a lot of our content will have um, O1 um, TIFF and O2 PDF because it came to us as a PDF and, or, um, and we're sharing both of those kind of manifestations of the same item. But um, so in this case, yeah, it's a little misleading on exactly what we store across the board because this is a, a kind of an odd, oddball example. I don't know if that answered at all your question. <laughs> It does answer, and now that I now that you explain that, I see what you've done. Like you have that data directory that's basically the payload of the the actual content itself, and then there's the it looks like there's like the metadata directory which would contain yeah the and and so if anyone is curious, I think she's looking at the object structure slide, and um, so the actual that data directory is really what is getting deposited, and all of the other content is getting added as part of the ingest process. All of those Joe files, that Mets file is getting created that then defines the relationships between all of the files within those data, that data folder, um, and all of that's getting serialized into a METS file and then um, referencing, you know, Jove streams, referencing um, other kinds of bits of information. Um, and that's, a lot of that's just additive as it goes through the ingest pipeline. Yeah, maybe giving some space for um, other questions. There's plenty of people on the line here. I'm sure there are lots of questions. I have a question about um, the actual file system in regards to like a file allocation table on sectors on disk and what choices people are making there and how that may or may not relate to the general discussion here. Um, in particular, things like um, ZFS or file systems with journaling that might do some sort of self-healing and um, do you rely on that? Um, I heard someone once say, you know, I don't do, I don't do that. I rely on my file system for it, which made me a little nervous. Um, but are, are people using stuff like ZFS for, for the actual, I know some, uh, one person at least mentioned Isilon, which has its own file system. Um, but I'm just wondering how that plays into this conversation and how some of the newer features of modern file systems um, might be able to handle some of these things. Thanks. There was actually an interesting, Nathan, um, conversation on the PASIG list about this recently, um, about like self-healing systems and whether or not you rely on them. And I think it ended with somebody, and I can't remember who, a woman who said, my problem isn't the file system, although they did have a file system, but oftentimes it was the human. Um, so the issue that they did have with their file system ended up being, um, a human error in migrating 
the file system from, I'm assuming, like one device to another. Um, and they were able to catch that the people who did the migration made mistakes because they do fixity checks. So, and, and I would argue that's not necessarily the bad of the system, that is the bad of the humans who were doing that migration, if that makes sense. And I can put the, a link to that conversation in the document. Thank you. I think I was, I was on that conversation, um, and I, I agree completely with everything you just said, Rosie. Uh, I, I personally love ZFS, but, um, and I am confident that if I lay data down on ZFS, it will still be there. Um, but I have no confidence at all in anybody who has access to that file system. And so you do need that additional software layer to validate that the stuff that you put there is still there and is still what you expect it to be. And no file system on the market can do that. Thank you. That, that's sort of, I, I wouldn't ever rely on ZFS entirely for, for to manage fixity. There always needs to be an independent check, but I, it seems as just a, the general place to store things, it's probably a good, a good file system to use. Um, I'll take a look at that, that discussion on PASIC. Thank you. I just want to add, like this is Peter Van Garden talking. I think that's a really good question because I think a lot of times we take a lot of the functionality given to us by the file system for granted when we do digital preservation. We've been talking a lot here about how we access the files from a file system. And I think Nathan's asked a really good question about we assume that the file system is, is, is doing all the stuff for us, grabbing all the bits, going across the sectors, doing all the error checking, all the error control. That's all magic that we assume is happening, but it, we all know it isn't because we're good preservationists. And I would like to see some of that at least made explicit in something like a common file system, if, if it's going to be a file system as opposed to a file API. Because so far we've been talking about a file API, which is also important. We also need it. But I guess Nathan's asking, what's the scope of this discussion? Does it include actually, and I agree with the like, depending on hardware devices or other kind of products for preservation functionality is a, is a really risk, is a risk. So fixity checking, we've um, like relying on hardware to do fixity checking is that's a strategic choice you make. But if we, somebody made a really good point about using baggots because we're bringing content forward over time. It's just, and, and the point about whether ZFS is great technology, but who's going to be there to support it, right? So my, my philosophy is I like all that functionality, including what we're depending on from the file system, to be in the declared domain of a preservation system. And whatever technology that migrates over time, we know that that concern is now part of the preservation system concern. And that's where I like about the direction of this, of this uh, conversation. And I've learned more in an hour than I have flying to a conference for, for two, three days. So thank you, everybody, very much for putting this together and participating. And I look forward to carrying on. I think one of the, um, uh, I think file systems are absolutely one of the most important technologies to understand in a file storage. Um, I think just to say that I know um, if we were to have to redo our DDN uh, layout or some other sort of major file storage system, I don't think we would get the same amount of buy-in across um, all institutions that are involved in this. So while I'm hoping that the, that the outcome of this, this effort will be um, understanding the different types of file systems and understanding their impact, um, I wouldn't want any sort of standardization effort to say, you know, we sort of gold stamp ZFS as a, as a preservation file system. Um, because I think it's getting getting that sort of buy-in across people who are using cloud storage and people who are using POSIX systems, and I think that'll just be uh, a, a, a goose chase that we'd have to reconcile at some point. I agree 100%, and what I like is the idea of like having common language to describe what file systems are doing, and we haven't been doing that yet. So we're very focused on the access part right now, the, and I agree, with, I want to just second the point that we should ideally, I, and if not in this project, somewhere else, we need to start talking about how much we rely on, you know, the file system to put stuff together for us and then create this PCDM file for us that we then go on and do things with. There's a lot happening that's take, being taken for granted there. And I love the fact that all these experts are now looking at that together or have been for a long time already, but now we're bringing all the work together. It's fantastic. And yeah, definitely, I think we got to stay away far away from any kind of like product or tool recommendations, all that kind of stuff. This is really about the common layer. And, and, all the value that PCDM has brought to the discussion. I see this happening here with the file system. I think it's great. Yeah, there well, is a document, oh, sorry, Andrew. There's a document called the um, Preservation Storage Criteria version two document. I don't know if people have seen that. 
Um, it was developed by Kate Duarte, Gail Truman, Sybil Schaefer, who I know is lurking, um, Jane Mandelbaum, and Nancy, Mc Nancy McGovern, Stephen, Stephen Knight, and Andrea Gothel. Um, and I can link to that. That actually kind of talks about some of the criteria around what you should be looking for for digital preservation storage. And when Emory was looking at um, how to, what type of storage they would want, we actually went through that document and used that to say, these are the things that we want to prioritize for digital preservation storage. And even indicated things that we just, yeah, we like this, but we actually want our repository system to do it. So yeah, if you could put a link in, in to the document, that'd be helpful. Um, but looking at the clock and uh, uh, wanting here to close up at the hour, um, just in, in terms of wrapping things up, uh, I'll, I'll just make a, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, one is that uh, I would suggest in, instead of like what was done, um, you know, sort of kicking off this effort, uh, spamming multiple lists, um, I will suggest that sort of further specific uh, discussion on this topic be channeled in, and I'm looking at agenda item number four here, uh, to the PASIG discussed, uh, <laughs> discuss mailing list. Um, and, and then also, as mentioned, there is a, a Slack channel. Uh, I'm also suggesting uh, that we have a follow-on meeting in January, uh, sort of same time as now um, on Friday, January 19th. Um, notes will be coming out, uh, sort of summarizing some of the points in this call. And uh, we don't have time to discuss it here, but uh, it, I, it would be, I think, helpful uh, for folks to be uh, thinking about what ideally uh, the outcomes of this group would be. And, and we've touched on points of you know, various, various aspects of it, but um, uh, yeah, because yeah, ideally uh, these conversations uh, are helpful in and of themselves, but uh, also uh, thinking about some, uh, some concrete outputs. Um, so with that, um, Andrew, any parting comments? No, no I'm, I'm good. Um, I really appreciated this. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks to everyone. Um, th this has been fantastic. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and talk to you soon. Thanks for organizing this. Yeah, thank you. It's good meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, all.